Welcome back. In the previous part, we learned that reading data from the main memory is painfully slow. So what you really want to do is to make sure that you read as little from the main memory as possible. In part 3b, we saw some examples of how you can reuse data in registers so that you can minimize the number of memory reads. This is always a good idea. Accessing registers is free. Getting data from anywhere else is not. This should be your plan A. Today we will see what you can do when your plan A failed. If you have already minimized the number of memory accesses and the remaining few memory accesses are still a bottleneck, what can you do next? We will learn how to cache memory hierarchy that lies between the CPU and the main memory can help you then. Here we have got a schematic view of the CPU that we are using as a running example. From the programmer's perspective, all data that you have in your program is either kept in registers or in the main memory. You as a programmer don't directly refer to caches. Either you use a register directly or you have a pointer that points somewhere in the main memory. In the hardware, there are several levels of cache memory between the registers and the main memory, but you can't directly control these. The CPU tries to use cache memory for all memory lookups. Whenever you refer to anything that is kept in memory, the CPU first tries to get it from the L1 cache. If that fails, the request is next sent to the L2 cache, then L3 cache. And only if it isn't there either, it is fetched from the main memory. And once you get the data, the CPU will also store it in cache memory, hoping that it might be used again soon. And here the key point is that cache memory is small, so whenever the CPU stores something there, something else has to be removed to make room for the new element. While the technical details vary between different CPUs, it is very important to have some order of magnitude understanding of the typical sizes of different levels of caches. Here are some numbers from the CPU that I'm using as an example. Some key points. First. Even the largest cache is only something like 6 megabytes. And moreover, it is shared between all CPU cores. 6 megabytes is not much. You can maybe fit there an array with 1000 by 1000 elements. But if your array has, say, 10,000 by 10,000 elements, you can only hope to fit maybe 1 or 2 percent of it in any of the caches. So, Repeatedly accessing the same array doesn't mean that you will automatically benefit from the caches. You will need to repeatedly access the same small fragment of it. Another figure to pay attention to is the size of the L1 cache. L1 is fast, but also really small. Just 32 kilobytes here. It is so little that often you can't even fit one row of your input data in L1 cache. Always do the math, estimate how large is your input data, how large is one row or whatever is a natural unit of input data in your application, and see how many units you can fit on different levels of the cache memory hierarchy. Another concept we need to be aware of is a cache line. The memory system does not care about individual bytes or individual words. It handles everything in much larger blocks that are called cache lines. In our machines, one cache line is 64 bytes. So if you refer to one byte somewhere in memory, you will get 64 bytes back, wanted it or not. This is one of the reasons why linear reading is good. If you anyway get other nearby elements to caches, you might as well try to benefit from it. Otherwise, you are just wasting bandwidth. So, what you want to do is to design your code so that your memory access pattern benefits as much as possible from the cache memory. 
You would like to make sure that almost always your memory reads refer to something that you have accessed so recently that it still remains in caches close to the CPU. Let's look at some concrete examples of what this might mean. Let's assume we have got uh, some orange and blue input elements, n orange elements, n blue elements. And our task is to compute some n by n output array where each element is computed from a pair of input values. For example, output element in row 2 and column 6 is some function of orange element number 2 and blue element number 6. So if you don't do anything more clever and just compute the output elements one by one, you will eventually read each orange element n times and you will also read each blue element n times. Now, what does this mean from the perspective of cache memory? The trivial solution is to just go through the output array in a natural order, two nested loops, the outer loop counting orange indexes, and the inner loop counting blue indexes. Now, what does the memory access pattern look like? For the orange array, things look good. We read the same item many times in a row. So if one item is small enough to fit in cache memory, we will here benefit from caches. But for blue elements, the memory access pattern is really bad. For example, after reading element zero, we don't come back to it until we have read all other blue elements. So most likely element zero won't be in the cache anymore when we need it again. If you look at a small slice of time, you will see that orange reads are tightly concentrated in a small region, which is great. But blue reads are all over the place, which is bad. And if you look at a bit longer slice of time, it doesn't get any better. Here blue reads are going to be cache messes unless all blue things fit into cache. We could change the order of loops, but then the problem just moves from the blue side to the orange side. But what if we followed this kind of an order? Now the orange memory access pattern would look like this. And the blue memory access pattern would look like this. The nice thing about this pattern is that if you look at a short fragment of time, you can see that both orange and blue memory references are concentrated in small parts of the arrays. And the same works in all scales. Look at a longer fragment of time and the memory references are concentrated in larger parts of arrays. So you will benefit from small and fast caches in small time scale and then larger and slower caches will help you in larger time scales. So this is one concrete example of how you could try to engineer your memory access pattern so that you explicitly take into account efficient use of caches. But all of this only makes sense if your blue and orange elements are small enough so that you can keep many such elements in caches. If each element is larger than L3 cache, none of this is going to do any good. So what to do if you need to compute something similar, but your individual elements are huge, maybe several megabytes? Now, all this heavily depends on the application, but sometimes it is possible to split your large elements in smaller parts. Then you can do the computation for the first halves, and separately do the computation for the second halves, and finally somehow combine the partial results, whatever it means in your application. Now, each individual computation can more easily benefit from caches as individual data elements are smaller. And if this works, of course, you can split further than in just two parts, as far as the overhead of storing and accessing all intermediate results does not start to dominate. It's a nice exercise to try to think about how to apply this idea to something like matrix multiplication. After all, in matrix multiplication, you are are just calculating lots of dot products, and if the vectors are too long to fit in cache, you can try to calculate dot products in smaller parts and then just combine the results. In the course material, you will see a bit more concrete example of how to apply these ideas in our sample application.
Putting together all that we have discussed so far, multicore parallelism, instruction level parallelism, vector operations, efficient reuse of data and registers, and good memory access pattern that helps with cache memory. We have finally pushed the running time to 0.7 seconds, more than 150 times faster than what was our starting point just two weeks ago. So now we have reached a point in which we know how to make a good use of all computational resources of modern CPUs, at least in some applications. And in our exercises and course material, you will learn a lot more. But so far, we have only talked about the CPU, while all modern computers have also got a GPU, a graphics processor, and there we have got even more computing power than in the CPU. Next week, we will start to learn how to write massively parallel programs for GPUs.